I'm uh, preaching through the songs of the season, the Christmas carols that have been a part of us and our tradition as Christians for hundreds of years. The one we're going to cover today, we started our service with. Oh, come, all you faithful, joyful and triumphant, right? Who knows that one? Is that anybody's favorite? Okay, it's fine. doesn't matter. Uh, it's a great song. It's a song of invitation. Everybody read the, 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 the lines of this ancient uh, carol hymn with me. Oh, come, all ye faithful. Read with me. I can't hear you. Here we go. Joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Yeah, that was a nice little rap there. Way to go. Uh, a great song, a song uh, that was, we don't know who penned it first. It was written in Latin. It's called uh, the Adeste Fidelis. It means, O come, all ye faithful. Uh, it was translated in English in like 1841, uh, but we've been singing it ever since. And uh, these words basically summarize the happenings of Luke chapter 2. Uh, when the shepherds were watching, Travis just so beautifully uh, recalled it for us in his moment by the Advent candles. Uh, the shepherds were watching their fields at night. The angels came and said, come to Bethlehem. See the king of us, the king of angels, right? And the king of kings. It's an invitation. It made me think this week, we should talk about the fact that the Christ life is an invitation. Everybody gets that, right? Life is full of invitations. Everybody uh, familiar with the concept of being invited? Maybe you're sitting here because the person next to you uh, invited, forced you, whatever. Maybe there's, you know, uh, compulsion. But, uh, uh, but if, if you're hanging out here, perhaps you're hanging out here because at one point, somehow, somewhere, someone invited you to be a part of what happens here at Bay Life. So grateful for you. Um, uh, most relationships, can we agree, start with invitations. As I thought about this, my relationship with my bride started when she asked me out. That's right, Eleanor asked me out the first time. Little qualifier there. It was one of those turnabout weekends at the school we went to, and so the girls were supposed to. Uh, I wasn't that great a catch. But that, uh, over three years, led, it's okay for me to say that. I can say that. That over three years led to me asking her uh, a very important question, uh, offering her an invitation. Uh, I, uh, in April of 1991, uh, took Eleanor on a tour of all the places this evening. Uh, we, we went on a tour of all the places that we had been to in our dating relationship. And then I took her out to the observatory in Lakeshore Drive uh, in Lake Michigan in Chicago. Uh, and I said, babe, do you, you remember this place? And she said to me, no. And I said, well, and, and she was like, which girl did you take here, right? She was like, uh, <laughs> you better hurry up. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I said to her, no, babe, that's because I want you to remember this is the place where I asked you to marry me. Bam! Yeah! There is no woman on earth who would not have said yes to that invitation. That was just money. I mean, I'm not even... But that's how our relationship went to the next level and deepened. I'll be celebrating 30 years with that woman in February. Yeah, you can clap for that. But it all started with an invitation. The, 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 the Christian story is about an invitation. An invitation from God to a rebellious humanity who through our forefathers uh, and foremother, uh, Adam and Eve, ha had turned away from him. He and his love demonstrated uh, you know, his, his mercy and his love to us by sending Jesus, even while we were sinners, to us so that Jesus could invite us to life with him. It starts at Christmas. The angels invite the shepherds. Come and see him. He's in Bethlehem, right? Now, we're going to talk about uh, uh, t some other characters from the story of Christmas. Uh, the magi, the wise men, the kings. They weren't kings, but uh, uh, they were invited and, and led by a star from where they lived, uh, a, 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 like a thousand miles east of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, just can I put a little pin in the sermon here for a second? Nobody has the wise men in their nativity scenes, right? Nobody's got them anywhere near because they weren't there at the birth of Jesus. Everybody gets that, right? 
Like, like probably Jesus is at least a year old, probably like 18 months old, by the time these guys, after seeing the star signifying the birth of Christ, made it over the you know, terrain of 1,000 miles from probably modern-day Iran uh, to Jerusalem on Camel, right? So uh, just do this for me when you get home. Take the wise men out of your nativity scene, walk them across the street to your neighbor's yard, okay? <laughs> and just kind of plant them in the front flower bed of your neighbor's yard. It may be roughly to scale, but that's kind of where they were at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. Just tell your neighbors, my pastor told me, I'll get them when we're done this thing, okay. But they were beckoned uh, to come and visit this Jesus, these Gentiles, pagans from a foreign land. Come and check this out, you gotta see the Son of God. It starts at Christmas. The invitation initiates uh, what will be a relationship between God and man through Jesus Christ. But if you go fast forward to 30 years that we don't have a whole lot of uh, information on in Christ's life between his birth and his actual immersion. Immersion? That's not the right word. He emerges. There we go. Coffee work. Anyway, uh, he emerges from anonymity, and he, and he comes, you know, to his, his cousin John the Baptist. And if you know the story, John the Baptist says, "I shouldn't be baptizing you; you should be baptizing me." But but these two cousins, whose stories are intermingled at Christmas time, are basically these grown men. And John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, and and uh, and later on, he he turns to a couple of his followers in John chapter one, and he says, "Behold, the Lamb of God! Like this is him." He's the one that I've been telling you is coming. It's, it's my cousin. <laughs> it's Jesus of Nazareth. Two of his disciples, we know them now to be John, the actual writer of the Gospel of John, and one of his friends, a guy named Andrew, whose, whose brother was Peter, right? Uh, they, they actually start following Jesus in John chapter 1. And here in, the, in the, one of the first scenes that we have of Jesus in his uh, three and a half years of ministry on earth, um, he, he turns around and he notices these guys following him and he says, Hey, what are you guys seeking? What, what, what do you want? Why are you following me, right? And these guys weren't ready for the question, perhaps, because they just said, ah, bah, 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 where are you staying tonight? And, and then Jesus um, so succinctly summarizes his mission on earth. He says, come on. He invites them. Come and you will see. He invites them into relationship with him. These guys would become his his early adopters, his early disciples. Uh, They, in turn, would go and invite their friends. Uh, Andrew went to his his brother Peter, and and Peter eventually drops his nets and follows Jesus. Uh, uh, John uh, goes to his brother. Uh, uh, Later on in the the story of of, of the Gospel of John in chapter 1, we we see Philip meet Jesus. and, And then Philip goes to his friend Nathaniel. And he says, hey, Nate, uh, he's here. The, the Messiah has come. I met him. He's from Nazareth. You remember what Nate said? Nathaniel's like, Nazareth? Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Uh, but then he meets Jesus and he follows. And it, it's all a, as a result of those who had been invited becoming inviters. I mean, fast forward to the end of, of Christ's time here on earth. He's, he's gone to the cross. He's, he's paid for the sins of the world by becoming for us uh, the sacrifice necessary for forgiveness. He, he dies, and then uh, three days later, he rises from the grave. He overcomes death. And through our faith in him, we too can be forgiven and overcome death and live eternally with him. He spends like 40 days after his resurrection hanging out with these same early inviteds. And he's getting ready to leave. Do you remember what he says at the end of Matthew and at the beginning of Acts? He says, hey guys, I'm going, but you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I've told you. I'll go with you, but that's your mission. And what he's saying, in other words, he's saying, go and invite people into relationship with me. Make sure that people know. And for 2,000 years, that's been happening. You and I, if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's because someone took the time to tell us about that and to invite us into his family. I have more to say, but can I pause right here and just kind of summarize this first point with, or this first part of my sermon with a couple walk away ideas, okay? Travis already kind of touched on this one. Um, But 
this, this child whose birth we celebrate at Christmas, this, this savior whose death and resurrection we celebrate at Easter. Uh, all of this has happened so that we could be invited back into life with God, even though sin has separated us from him. And the baseline modus operandi of those who follow Christ is joy. I don't know what you came in here with. If you, know, you kind of you know, walked in with a frown on your face, there's all these kinds of circumstances in your world that are um, making a mess of your life, but can I remind you this morning of what is true about you if you are in Christ? You have been the recipient of the greatest invitation to hit the planet. You are forgiven, restored, redeemed. You are living eternally with the God who made you through your faith in Jesus Christ. That is, that is cause for celebration. I don't know what else is happening, but the baseline existence for those who are in Christ is joy, rejoicing. It'd be entirely appropriate for you to walk out of here just kind of doing a little dance. Like this, you know, we may not be dancing on the outside all the time, but inside, we should just be doing a little dance. And that's it. listen, we get that. There are certain joys in life, uh, uh, you know, joyful triumphs like the song tells us, right? That makes us, you know, kind of want to dance. I'll, I'll be honest with you, when I taste something really good, if I'm standing up, I start kind of wiggling a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right? And everybody go watch the Bucks game today. If one of those guys crosses the end zone, you know, crosses the, the, the touchdown line, whatever, what, uh, goal line, that's what we call them. Tobin, they're goal lines. If you cross the goal line in football, you've already got one choreographed. If you're a professional football player, there is something about to happen. The cameras are going to go on you. You're going to get all your friends. You're going to sit down like you're in a, you know, a big canoe and you're going to row together or you're going to, you know, do some kind of... You know, kind of dance like, I don't know how to do it, but they do, right? And why do they dance in the end zone? For your entertainment? No. It's hard to score a touchdown in professional football for most people, not the Bucks, but anyway. Uh, and the dance makes sense. Listen, look at me. If you're not, I don't know if you're picking up what I'm putting down, but here's the deal. I don't care what's going on in your life, and I know a lot of you are going through it right now, but if you are in Christ, no matter what's happening in your circumstances, your baseline is the dance, the dance of joyful triumph. Rejoice over the fact that you've received the invitation. Now, I know many of you, you get that, and hopefully if you didn't come in here dancing, you leave doing that little wiggle, right? But let me, let me, let me remind you, the mission that God gave us through his son in Matthew 28 was not uh, to, to go and, and, and just go be disciples. Like, like our, we, we've rephrased it a little bit. We say we live here at Bay Life to glorify God by being disciples who what? Who make disciples. It doesn't stop it by being disciples. Lots of churches, that's where they stop. We'll glorify God by everybody who's here doing the very best that they can to honor Jesus, which is good. Don't get me wrong. But those churches... <laughs> They're not the rivers of God's grace and goodness to the world that desperately needs it. They're, they're like ponds or puddles. They just kind of collect the grace of God for themselves and it never flows from them to a world that desperately needs it. I preached a message a long time ago about us being pipes. We're conduits for what God has given us. We are meant to take that and share the invitation with the world. Not just rejoice in the invitation, but share the invitation. It's gonna come up on your screens right about now. There it is, there it is. Share the invitation. You and I, as the invited, have become the inviters. So that's my summary for the first half of the sermon. Here comes the rest, you ready? We're gonna go now to the story of the Magi. And in this story, we're gonna see uh, three different characters. Um, a guy named Herod the current king of the Jews at the time of Jesus' birth, a, a group of men, the chief priests and the scribes, who assist in the, uh, uh, the location, sharing the location of where Jesus, as the Old Testament prophets had predicted, had probably been born. And then you got the Magi themselves, these Persian astrologers, a thousand miles into their journey, hoping 
to find the one that they left home for. And in these three, we're going to see kind of the embodiment of what happens on this side of the, of the invitation that Jesus submits to the world. In Herod, we have a, a defiant denier of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, this, this Jesus that we celebrate here at Christmas and always. He wants no part of him. Uh, he's a hard no. Everybody say hard no. Uh, it, take, your, take your right fist and kind of shake it in the air and say hard no. Yeah, this is how people get when you talk to them about Jesus sometimes. I love this phrase hard no. Is everybody, in fact, let's all adopt hard no. Hard no is the indelicate denial. It's the like, hey, listen, I'm not even going to think about this. I'm not going to consult my calendar. For me, this is a hard no, Right? Like if you invited me to come over and, you know, join you in watching the Yankees play any baseball team and you asked me to root for that, that baseball team, it is an immediate and resounding hard no. No offense to you if you love them. I don't. Is everybody with me? Some of you, wow. He's... But when it comes to Jesus, there's a, a huge portion of our world that this is their posture. They're haired, hard no. In fact, I'm going to do everything I can to eradicate, to keep this Jesus from supplanting me on the throne of my life. Now, the chief priests and the scribes, we're going to talk about them. They aren't a hard no as much. They're just more of a whatevs. Everybody do that with me. Ready? Whatevs. You got the hard no and you got the whatevs. These guys are some of the most learned Bible scholars in all of Israel, right? They're like, you know, just below the high priest in rank, these chief priests, and they're the scribes. They're the ones who are in charge of actually copying the Old Testament scriptures of the time. Uh, they knew the Bible, at, at least as, as it was formed to that point, inside and out. They, they didn't have to go and consult when we were asked by Herod here in this story, hey, where was, where was the, you know, the, the child meant to be born? They, they knew Micah 5, verse 2. They, they just said it. But uh, I, I always wonder, you know, what, what happened in the pieces of the story that aren't reported in our scriptures? I don't know this for fact at all, but, uh, but I can kind of picture this, maybe you can too, that, that the scribes, as they kind of share this answer from scripture with these pagan Persians, you know, about where Jesus is meant to be born according to the prophets, um, maybe the pagan Persians are like, oh, I'm so thankful you've given us the final piece of the puzzle. We know where to go now. We're heading there right now. Do you want to go with Anybody ever offered this uh, opportunity, you know, or an, or an opportunity like this? We've got this great opportunity. Do you want to go with? And the person that you ask, I don't know, maybe they're not as excited about whatever you're going to as, as you are. Maybe they've got other things that they need to get to. And so they understand it'd probably be cool, but they're just like, eh, not for me. What ifs? Indifference. Herod. Hard no. Denial. And defiance. Chief priests and scribes, indifference, whatevs. Then you got the Magi. And the Magi, these pagans from Persia, uh, they don't have a whole lot of information to go on, but what they do have, they have put their faith fully in. Everybody gets that, right? It takes a lot of faith to get on a camel and start following a light in the sky. And they follow it. Through all kinds of, we can assume, you know, trials at, co at great cost to them. Uh, they, they, they trudge the, the 900 or 1,000 miles from where they were located to this foreign land, completing the journey. And when they got to the, to the place where Mary was, you know, uh, holding our Savior, Jesus, this little child, now we're going to see that they fell on their face before him and worshiped him. Now, probably uh, unlike many others or probably anybody else in Scripture, these who had the least to go on uh, showed the greatest faith in the story of Jesus on earth. They went all in. They worshiped. They, they gave of themselves these gifts in honor of this baby. And so those are the three that we have represented here. I'm going to walk through them briefly as we close uh, but, but I know every time I preach, I'm preaching to at least, well, always, two kinds of people. People who have 
received Christ, the invited who have said yes, and people who have not yet received Christ. And I don't know which one you are, but there's something in each of these emblems, these guys in the story uh, for you to consider. If you've not yet received Christ, I guess that's over here. Uh, you need to understand your sin nature is making you Herod. You're going all hard no with Jesus because you're adopting the ideas of the atheists and those that you listen to in your college and, and, and maybe you're you know, just disinterested entirely with, with there being a God in existence and, and a God who wants to sit on the throne of your life and so you're doing everything you can to keep him out of your construct. Now, that might be you. Maybe you're, you're someone in here who's not so much hard no, but you're just indifferent. You're what ifs. Like you grew up in the church. You know the stories. Uh, you're doing your, your mom or your dad a solid by being here right now. Thanks for coming. But you're just like, yeah, it's, you know, it's just not for me. Or it's just not for me right now. I love listening to people talk about that. I'll get back to Jesus, just not now. And, and you're missing out on what God has purposed you for, which is life with him through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. My hope for you, if, if that's you, if you're a hard no, if you're a whatevs as far as being on this side of faith, my, my hope for you is this morning or in this season soon, you will go all magi on this thing. And you'll just set aside all these things that, you know, like Hebrews says, hinder you and the sins that entangle you. You'll set all that stuff else and, and you'll run towards your savior, Jesus Christ, like the magi did. And you'll put your faith in him. Now, I know lots of you are sitting here and you've already accepted the invitation. You're in. But isn't it amazing? The same things we struggled with before we met Jesus are the same things we struggle with once we meet him. And there are areas of your life that perhaps you're going all Herod. Uh, I, I, I submit, I do this all the time when I preach. Has anybody seen me do this before? Here's my life, Lord. Here's everything that you, just not this. And I'm going to keep this for me. This is where I sit on my throne, not you, but everything else. But on this one, hard no. We, we still do it. Because everybody gets that God is constantly inviting us. It, whether we don't know him yet or we do, he's constantly inviting us to a deeper and more meaningful experience with him, to a, to a, to a, a life that is uh, more conformed to the image of his son. Come on, let's go. Let's go. And sometimes we're like, yeah, I'm in. And then other times we're like, hard no. More commonly, I think, in the church, it's not the hard no, it's just the indifference. Yeah, I know I'm supposed to do that stuff. Yeah, I know there's probably more meaningful expressions of this life with Christ. And I know what the Bible says about what I'm supposed to do. But you know what? I'm going to give you Sunday morning from 1045 to 12 o'clock, or if he goes long, geez, a little bit longer. But then the rest of me is for me. Even though I know, I just don't care. I can't be bothered. There's other things that are more important to me right now. It's not that I am angrily shaking a fist in the face of a, a God who's in authority over me. It's just, I can't be bothered. My prayer for those of us who are the invited, who perhaps have that angry fist in the air in some area of our lives, or who have, you know, it's kind of got to a point where we've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, uh, this is all I'm giving. This is all you get, Lord. My hope for us is that we'll go all magi in this life with him. And we'll let nothing stand in our way in our pursuit of him. And on a daily basis, we will fall before him and worship him with this life that he's given us. Can we read the verses real quick? I'll let you go home. Doesn't matter. Here it comes. In verse 1 of Matthew chapter 2, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. That's the Magi. It's from uh, uh, the Latin uh, for magician. They, they were astrologers. They looked at the skies. They kind of formulated their, their own religious beliefs as, as, as you know, uh, pagans from Persia. They, uh, they, they looked to the stars, just like the, the Greeks and the Romans developed their myths around what they saw in the heavens, Right? These guys have been doing that, but they saw this, this star in the east. 
They had uh, learned enough from some of the Jews who probably uh, hundreds of years before had settled in their land. Anybody remember the Old Testament? The, the northern kingdom of Israel was taken over by the Persians and the Medes and taken into captivity. And lots of those Jews hadn't returned back to Israel. Uh, they had just continued to be Jewish in this foreign land. And, and so they perhaps had uh, shared what they had believed about their God and, and their scriptures and the prophecies of this one who was promised who would come. And so these Persians apparently heard that story, saw the star and said, we got to go. Can I give you a, a, just a, a, a real quick, is there a star over my head right now? Uh, th th there's been all kinds of uh, uh, debate as to you know, what that star was. Like people can actually go back and they can scientifically deduce where the planets were and maybe where a comet came into play and stuff like that. And there's been all kinds of study about that. Can I just share you what I, what I, what I think that star was? Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, angels, messengers from God were actually called stars. Like when you hear the story of Lucifer, who was to be Satan, our adversary, uh, uh, he, was, uh, fall, he fell from heaven. He fell as a star from the heavens, it tells us in Isaiah. Um, Jesus is the, uh, uh, referred to as the bright and morning star, right? Uh, uh, anyway, uh, so, so stars are kind of synonymous with, with angels. This is what I believe. I don't know. When we get to heaven, we'll find out. Everybody want, you know, get behind me in line. I'm going to ask first. But, uh, uh, but I think that this is actually an angelic messenger from heaven who has come and is basically, come on. Let's go, guys, over here in this direction. So they walk 900, 1,000 miles. They get to Jerusalem. It's interesting. The star doesn't go to Bethlehem first. It goes to Jerusalem. And that's where this conversation begins. Verse 2, where is he, as they have an audience with this king named Herod, where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship or to pay our respects like a foreign dignitary, uh, not necessarily a deity initially, but, but we've come, you know, as a response to these things to, to pay our respects and, and to worship this king who has come. And so it is that Herod becomes the hard no character in this story. Some people respond to the invitation of Jesus, whether they've met him yet or not, with a hard no. When Herod, verse 3, uh, the king, current king of the Jews, uh, heard this, he was troubled. And all of Jerusalem with him. Now, he didn't go on his phone and, you know, go on Twitter and post, hey, uh, you know, bad news, everyone. There's a, there's a baby born somewhere in the country that it's going to be, you know, my uh, dethroner. And it, it, when he says that all of Jerusalem was uh, disturbed or troubled with him, he's talking about his cabinet, those who are in his government. And he's basically saying everybody who's con whose power is contingent to mine is sweating this just like I am. If there's another king out there, then I might be done here on this throne. And so he sets into uh, course his plan to make sure that he stays on his throne. Uh, for the sake of time, let me just summarize. Uh, he, he basically goes to the scribes and the chief priests. He finds out the, uh, you know, the, the, what the Bible has to say, that the Old Testament prophets had to say about the location of this birth. It's Bethlehem. He comes back to these guys and he says, hey, guys, um, it, it's, it's Bethlehem. That's where you're going. And in verse 7, uh, he says this. He says, it says that he summoned the wise men secretly and he ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. So, so he's, he's kind of going calendar on this. Hey, guys, around when did the star first show up in your sky? What's he doing? Is he interested in, in cataloging this for his, history's sake? Is he? No. He's trying to figure out, if I have to go down to Bethlehem, spoiler alert, in verse 16 he does, and I have to start killing babies to make sure that no babies from Bethlehem ever grow up to be able to take my throne. I need to know basically uh, how old I need to stretch this thing out to so I can make sure that that decree covers this king that you look for. So maybe they said, I don't know, it was 12 months ago. I mean, we've been for the better part of a year heading over this way. He's like, all right. And so it was that in verse 16, he says, any child two years old or younger, a male born in Bethlehem, they need to be put to death. Uh, Herod goes to these extreme measures, uh, his cunning in his dealing with the, the wise men. Look what it says in verse 8. He, he says to them in verse 8, he says, hey, man, go to Bethlehem, and when you go and search diligently, diligently for the child, hey, when you find him, uh, text me. You know, put a pen, actually. Send me his locale uh, so that I can come and worship him too. Everybody say, liar, liar, pants on fire. Yeah, Herod's lying. 
He's like, hey, I want to know where this kid is so that I can come and end him. Why? Here's why. Real simple. I've already told you. Herod's comfortable on the throne. This is what sin does to us. We got one throne in our lives. It's rightful uh, uh, inhabitant is Jesus. But whether we're on this side of faith in him or on this side of faith in him, not yet know him, do know him. It is a constant <laughs> musical chairs melee of us trying to get back. The sin nature wants us to stay on the throne. And so we go hard no with Jesus, whether it's you know, entirely in, in not having faith in him or hard no in certain areas of our life so that we can maintain the throne. We're kind of like this kid in this picture uh, who's uh, uh, hanging out uh, at Lowe's. Have you seen these things? Now they've put, you can kind of see him there in the front. He's got a steering wheel he's hanging on to. Can you see that? He's facing forward. And back when I was a kid, we didn't have anything cool like this, right? Your mom would just kind of like fold you up and shove you underneath the thing and say, let's go shopping. Anyway, uh, uh, but these days it's like, hey, let's entertain the kids. Let's keep them quiet. Here's, here's a steering wheel. Make believe you're driving this thing. And as I see these kids kind of tooling around Lowe's or Walmart or wherever they are, uh, it always makes me giggle that, you know, probably some of them actually think this is working. I'm steering and this is going wherever I want it to go. And, and how disappointing it must be for some of them when they turn this way and dad turns that way. This thing doesn't work. And so they try again and again. They turn this way and dad turns that way. And they get frustrated. Disillusioned, disappointed. Because they, like Herod, had always thought, I'm on the throne. I'm steering. This is my life. But the truth is this, whether you accept it or not, there is a God. He is in control. And no matter how hard you try to steer away from him, deny his existence, shake an angry fist in his face, he ultimately determines your destiny. And the Bible tells us that at the end of your life or the end of this world's life, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the mission of the church is to help people who don't understand that to understand it and accept it now. Because it's going to happen either way. The scribes and the Pharisees, or the scribes and the chief priests comes into play. Herod comes to them and he says, hey, uh, where is it in the Bible that we have this information? And these are the ones who hear the, uh, the invitation of Jesus and respond with whatevs. Uh, they say in verse 5 of, of Matthew chapter 2 that, it's in Bethlehem of Judea because it's written in the prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, O you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for, you shall, for from you shall come a ruler who will be a shepherd of my people, Israel. Two kings in Israel's history had been born in Bethlehem. Uh, the one for which the city was named was a guy named David. David was born in Bethlehem and became probably the greatest king of Israel. But there in his city, uh, Micah had prophesied, yep, the Messiah will be born here as well. Uh, these guys who had rightly pointed to the place in Scripture where this evidence was, who had told them, yeah, I know the star brought you here to Jerusalem, Persia, way over here. They came to Jerusalem. But six miles south of Jerusalem is this city of David, Bethlehem. And again, I wonder if the, 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 the wise or the, the, yeah, the, the magi had said, oh, we're going. Do you want to go? And these guys are just like, eh. And so many people, that's their mentality towards Christ. Uh, it can keep us from him in the first place. I was having lunch, or I guess dinner, with a couple from our church. And my buddy Mike was just telling me, hey, man, that was me. I grew up in the church. I knew everything I needed to know, but I just wasn't following. I didn't care until I met her, his wife, and, uh, and, and started hanging out with her. It was the same way with me and Eleanor. Eleanor had no business dating me when she met me. I was barely Christian. Are you with me? Like, not really uh, that, that, that follow-y at all. Uh, but over time, I realized this is not just something I can be whatevs about. This deserves my entire being, my all. And so we come to the Magi. Some respond to the invitation with a 
a wise all in. They wisely go all in. And I've already kind of told you this, but uh, if you don't know the story of the Magi, from Persia to Jerusalem, down to, Je- to Bethlehem, they get there finally. The, the star, I love this part of the story, the star moves with them. Isn't that cool? They got to Jerusalem and, and they heard from the, the book uh, that it's going to be in Bethlehem, but then just to affirm that, the actual star that they've been following all this way to Jerusalem goes in front of them like a beacon and they follow it all the way down to where Jesus and Mary are. They come in, and if you know the story, uh, it tells us, I think, in, in verse 10, uh, that it's, as they got there, they, they rejoiced exceedingly in the star. And then in the, in the next verse, verse 11, it tells us they, they entered into the place uh, in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 2. They em- em- it'll, it'll show up here in just a second. Uh, they, they entered into the place, and they saw the child and, and Mary, his mother. And, and, and there it is. What they do? They fell down and worshiped him. Okay, has anybody seen a baby lately? What'd you do when you saw this baby? Maybe it was your niece or your nephew or your grandson or your granddaughter for the first time you see them. What's your move? What's your move? Oh. Right? You put your face in theirs and they're like, right? And then maybe you're that, you know, that grandma or that grandpa or that aunt or uncle or that whatever. And, and you want to, and so you immediately pick that, oh, you believe you fat one, yeah. And, uh, uh, and you do whatever you do, right? Has anybody ever walked into a, a, a family's house where they're, they're you know, going to share the joy of their, their newborn and, uh, and, and, and your first move is to hit the floor? Anybody ever done that? No, that's not a normal reaction. Grown men and women don't typically worship 12 to 18 month year old children. But in this case, these pagans from Persia come all this way and the first move is face down worship of the king of kings. This otherwise seemingly insignificant child in this otherwise seemingly insignificant town it's the worship of these Gentiles from another land. They give their gifts. There's all kinds of parallels here. But I want you to leave here picturing that. Whether you know Jesus yet or not, if you're on this side of the Jesus question, here's the deal. It, 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 you can say that it's your logic and your reason, but ultimately it's a spiritual issue. In sin, you have been either dead set against the rule of Christ in your life like Herod, and it's a hard no for you, or as our adversary would love, you've just kind of been like left to be like, nah, no big deal. Good for you if you like him, but I'm, I'm just going to do me over here. And there's an indifference in your life. Here, here's what I'd tell you. The mission of this church and any church worth being a church is for you to understand that we have understood, like the Magi, we who follow Jesus have received that invitation in the greatest thing you can do with your life is to give it back to the God who made you. May you go all in with Jesus Jesus, if you don't know him yet. If you're sitting here this morning and you have received Christ, understand that your, 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 your sin nature inertia is to go back on the throne, hard no, or to just kind of be complacent and just do this with the very least that you have. Let me encourage you. That's not what we've been called to. We've been called to a life that's baseline, uh, a dance life, a rejoicing life. And so if this is the day where you repent of your hard no or where you rekindle the flame that is your passion for Christ, I pray that he brings that about in you so that you can be like the Magi and give uh, everything that you've got. Go all in with this Jesus whose birth we celebrate in this season. We're going to sing that song that this sermon was based on. Will you stand with me as we sing, O Come, All You Faithful. He alone is worthy. Father, uh, 
Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, thanks for sending Jesus to be born, to live a perfect life, becoming the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Thanks for um, loving us enough to allow your son to die so that through faith in him we might have life. Thanks for that invitation. For all of us who uh, pray with me right now, who have received that, help us to walk in life with the joy uh, of what that invitation has um, meant for us. We've, we've been brought from death to life. We have, even as uh, the circumstances of this world go crazy around us, we have um, rejoicing in you as our baseline. Uh, help us to be committed to sharing the invitation with others and, and, and help us to be mindful of the fact as, as those who have accepted your invitation, there's a gravitational pull uh, back towards who we were without you, back towards self-sufficiency and self-worship. Uh, keep us from that, God. Keep us from being complacent. Uh, lead us, God, to uh, the, a magi kind of life where we let nothing keep us from our pursuit of you. Uh, where we act on faith, where we don't uh, have sight, where we move and, and, and not just uh, believe in theory. We act. Uh, we're doers and not just hearers. Uh, Lord, I want to pray for anybody who's listening to me right now who's not yet received you. Um, I pray that they'd understand in, in uh, new ways for the first time just how much you love them and how much uh, your desire in life is, is to be with them. Uh, help them to receive your invitation. Help them to understand that you know, this running, this, uh, this self-preservation, this, this hoarding of the throne of their lives, it just leads to nothing. Um, kindle their hearts uh, away from indifference. Help them not just to be you know, people who know a lot about your, your word and you know, have a history in your church. Help them to go from that to being vibrant, passionate, magi followers of you. That's my prayer. For those that I love, for those that people in here love, that's my prayer. Overcome them. Uh, we know that you steer life, steer them in your direction and draw them to yourself. I pray all this because... Uh, um, it's, it's your heart for your people. Use us as your church in making a difference for you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next time. I'll be over here if you want.